Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Today we are going to talk about one of the mysteries in the universe, one of the things that the Science Channel tries to explain, Albert Einstein tried to explain. A lot of people look at it and don't understand it, but we're going to look at it today, and when you leave here today, you're going to understand this, the mystery of time. Time and space, the time continuum. How does it work? Is time a constant? Is, is time like light? We discovered last week that light moves up 299 million meters per second, 186,000 miles per hour. That light is constant, and many things are built upon light. We also discovered that God is light. God is the spiritual essence of the physical light. God Himself is not full of photons. God is a type of light that is different than the light that we see. The reality is, when you look at me today, you are not really seeing me. And when I look at you, I'm not really seeing you. I am seeing light reflected off of you. You are seeing light reflected off of me. If we turned out the lights, you would not see me. I am not like Homer Simpson. I do not work in a nuclear factory and glow in the dark. That was humor. I'm sure we can edit that out. <laughs> but the reality is, we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about time. Let's put a scripture up on the board. Psalm 90, verse 4. Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight, this is talking about God, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. And like a watch in the night. Now Peter taught this. Peter was Jesus' best friend. They hung out together. If anybody knew what Jesus was talking about, it was Peter. Loretta and I have been over at the Galilee. We've actually been to Peter's house. Uh, there's a structure built way up above it with a, a glass floor so you can look down at the archaeological remains. But Jesus would have gone to Peter's house many times. And just like those of us who are friends, you know, you have friends that you have over to your house and, and you talk about things that you don't talk about in public and you talk about weird things. Like, have you ever thought about, you know? So if anybody knew what Jesus was thinking, it was Peter. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 3.8. 2 Peter 3.8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Now when he says do not forget, that means they must have talked about it before. I'm not going to tell you to, hey, don't forget what I told you if I've never told you anything. So he said, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord... One day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. Now what in the world does that tell us? That tells us that God does not operate on the same linear line of time that we operate on. We must understand this. Time is created. When we say that God created everything, one of the things He created was He created time. And we are living in a dispensation, one of the dispensations of time, that was created for man. Before time existed, there was eternity. And after time will end, and there will be a time when time will end, 
there will be eternity. And so is time a substance? Is it something that can be measured? Now there was a day when Joshua, who was the leader of the Israelites, he was in a a fight for his life with his army. And the Amorites were being defeated, but the defeat of the Amorites depended upon the Hebrews continuing their fight. And so let's take a look at Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord. Did you know you can talk to God? And what is impossible, and Jesus said this, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And when you have your back against the wall and you're facing something that looks like there is no way in Hades you're ever going to get out of this, you can't even think of a way to tell God to get you out because you can't even think of a way. God has a way. He makes a way when there is no way. Joshua must have known this because Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, he didn't just say this in the back closet. And you know, sometimes we do that. We get in the back closet and we talk to God about stuff. That way, if it doesn't happen, we're not embarrassed. Are you following me? Joshua got up in front of all the people. He knew his God and he knew the power of his God. And here's what he said. Son, stand still over Gibeon. And moon, in the valley of Ajalon. Wow. He's having this battle and he needs more daylight. He needs more time to win the battle. They're winning, but they need more time. They need to finish it. And so he stands up in front of all the people of Israel and he says, Son, stand still. Moon, don't you move either. Next verse. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Wow. You ever want uh, an extra day? Hmm. Verse 14. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man. Now, did you hear that? The Lord listened to a man. Now, listen. Jesus had not even shed His blood on the altar yet. This is not under the new covenant. Joshua was not somebody that had the Spirit of the living God living inside of him. He was following by the same type of faith that Abraham had. He was following with a faith of what he believed strongly, but he didn't have the aid of the Holy Spirit living inside of him like we have. So if he could talk to God with confidence and believe God, how much more should we believe God and have confidence? There has been no day like it before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. You know, people say, well, you know, I want to be on the Lord's side. Well, then fight for Israel. Hello? God hasn't changed. He hasn't changed His allegiance. It's His chosen people. They didn't choose Him. As in Fiddler on the Roof, He says, Lord, I know we're Your chosen people, but couldn't You choose somebody else for a little while? Because there seemed to be so much persecution. (laughs) 
Can you imagine a place where time moves slower than it's moving right now? Can you imagine a place where time is moving faster? Can you imagine a, t- a place where time stops? Or even moves backward? Can you imagine a place where time becomes divided and there's two different streams of time? Or three? Or ten? Or a million? Can your brain actually imagine this? Are these things possible? Does the Bible even suggest that time is changeable? I, uh, I know that the Bible tells us that God somehow moves backward in time because time was created for us. We are living right now on a linear time. That's not God's time. But when you got saved, now Ryan, I know that you were squeaky clean when you were a kid. And when you got saved, there were hardly any sins that needed to be forgiven. But that one or two little times when you cheated at marbles on the playground or whatever it was, when you got saved, the Bible says that old things passed away, all things became new. You became a new creation in Christ. And the Scripture tells us in context, you can read this in multiple places, that God somehow moved into your past and eliminated those sins. So that the sins of your past don't exist anymore. It's not that they're just covered up. They're eradicated. They're gone. They are no longer in existence. When you say something about your past to God, to Him, He's saying, what are you talking about? I don't remember that. It says He will remember them no more. How can that be? See, we live in a world and we believe it's governed by time. We believe that. Whether you you think you believe it or not, you do. We believe that time is a constant. And we believe that time is the same for everyone. It governs everything we do. To a degree. Everything we announced today in our announcements has to do with time. Uh, Let's take a look at some scientific facts on time. You know what muons are. Muons. They're pronounced muons uh, after a a Greek letter. A muon is an unstable subatomic particle. Now listen to this. About 10,000 muons reach every square meter of the Earth's surface every minute. Now follow me on this. These charged particles form as byproducts of cosmic rays colliding with molecules in the upper atmosphere. They travel at realistic speeds. They can penetrate tens of meters of rock and other matter before they dissolve. But here's the deal. They only exist in two millionths of a second. Now maybe you can't figure out two millionths of a second. But science can. We have atomic meters and clocks that can govern this. Now the question has been, if they only, if they only exist for two millionths of a second, And they're not traveling at the speed of light. Close to it. But not at the speed of light. How can they survive coming from outer space, 
coming through our atmosphere and penetrating into the ground and into this room constantly. Because that takes much, much more than two millionths of a second. And science has quibbled over that for years. And then they discovered this reality. Because they are traveling so close to the speed of light, time is altered for them. And what's two millionths of a second to us is not two millionths of a second to them. Now, before you get brain cramps, let me bring it down to something else. In Germany, in the early 1900s, there was a young physicist, and I'm sure you have all heard of him. His name was Albert Einstein. And he made a discovery that changed the way we think about time. He had an equation that was... It's, it's been in every science fiction show that you've ever seen, and kids like to put it up on a chalkboard. E equals MC squared. And basically what this is... Uh, he discovered that time was not a constant. Like we say, light is a constant. Time is not a constant. But it's relative to speed. And that as you become closer to the speed of light, time slows down. Oh boy. Now, Later, let's go to the next slide too. I have, only have two slides. I just got this one off of Google so you'd think I was smart. But as you get further down the road with Einstein's theory, he came out with a second theory. A lot of people don't talk about that. But his second theory was that time, time itself is actually relative to gravity also. So you have... Speed and gravity. And they have discovered that with our space capsules that have gone around the moon and come back and, and all that, these atomic clocks that are more accurate than your Rolex, uh, <laughs> these atomic clocks can determine there is a difference in time. It may be in milliseconds, but there is a difference in time. So they, they know that this is true. And that with gravity, do you understand, I don't know if we're going to get into this as a mystery of the universe sometime, but gravity, science has never been able to figure out what makes gravity work. They've never been able to figure it out. They have no idea what gravity is. I mean, they know what it does, but they don't know why it does it. And they have just discovered, and this is just in the last few months I was reading in Scientific Weekly, that the black holes, which they didn't used to think existed, but now in the last 25 years they know that they actually are real. If you're reading in old scientific stuff, they say they're a theory. They're not a theory anymore, they're real. That the farthest black hole in the universe that they have discovered still has gravitational pull all the way to us. And they think that gravity itself can be infinite. And if time is infinite, gravity is infinite, eternity is infinite, this brings new revelation to when we say we serve an infinite God. And all of this piddly little stuff that we deal with on a daily basis is nothing to God. We've got to quit thinking of God as, can He do this? If God has to alter the time-space continuum for you, He will do it if you can just have the faith of Joshua and stand up and Believe that what you say will come to pass. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, if you say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you believe in your heart that the things you say 
will come to pass. Then you will have whatever you say. Obviously, Joshua must have known God well enough that he was able to stand up and believe that his God told the truth and that he knew what he needed. What did he need? He needed about 24 more hours. That's what he needed. And he spoke to the sun and he commanded it to stand still. And lo and behold, the sun stood still. When Robbie was younger, many times Loretta and I said, son, stand still. And he didn't do it. That's not what we're talking about. All right. Now, don't ask me how all of this physics stuff works. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a nuclear physicist, all right? I'm just a humble pastor in the Ozarks. Sir Isaac Newton said that time existed in and of itself, separate from any outside influence. But later he discovered, and we now know, that wasn't true. In the uh, 4th century, there was a, uh, a heretic. And he later became a, a, a bishop, a, a Christian bishop, and his name was Augustine. And he wrote a paper that had some modern physicist, even to this day, 1,500 years later, scratching their heads. He said, now keep in mind, this is in the 4th century. He said... Time comes in three phases. Time past, time future, and time present. Now he said this, time past is gone. Time future hasn't happened yet. And time present takes up exactly no space. Concluding, time doesn't exist. It's only an illusion. Hmm. Hmm. In 1897, they thought that the smallest particle in the earth was an atom. And uh, this physicist discovered electrons. We know that light contains photons or particles. Yesterday I was reading about an experiment that they did at NASA and they put light through an object and they could watch the photons go through. And then they put another object out there and they wanted light to go through that object also and they discovered something that to this day they still haven't figured out. And that is that the light went through both objects at the same time. And they were in different places. Now let that sink in for a moment. That kind of lets us know a reality of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible's been teaching this for years. When my dear friend John Maroney got saved, and in case you've all wondered, he is saved. He's a good friend too. And when he got saved, the Holy Spirit moved inside of him. When Jerry got saved, the Holy Spirit moved inside of him. And when his bride got saved, the Holy Spirit moved inside of her. Not a different Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. If John got saved first and then Jerry got saved later, God didn't have to take a part of His Spirit out of John to move it over to Jerry. No. John has all the fullness of the Spirit of God in him. And Jerry has all the fullness of the Spirit within him. And his wife, which by the way, the decorations look beautiful. Didn't they look nice coming into the church? today? Thank you. Thank you. And your crew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Well, think about that. That means that the Holy Spirit is in two different places at the same time. 
How many Christians are there on the earth today? A billion? Out of seven billion people? What is there? Maybe one billion Christians? The Holy Spirit is in a billion different places, moving around all over. And each one has the fullness. Not another Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit. So can one object be in two places at the same time? Well, the Bible says God is light. Wow. God is good. Well, with all of this scientific information, one conclusion is in agreement with the Bible. And in the dispensation of time that we are in right now, and that is this. In... Now, now follow me on this because I'm going to show you something different here in a moment about a helix. But in this dispensation of time that we're in right now, it has a beginning and it has an end. In the beginning, that's the beginning of our time. How long ago was it? I don't know. 13.8 billion years ago at the Big Bang? I don't know. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's when time began for us. And then God placed us on the earth. And the Scripture says that we will be on the earth. Man's days on the earth are 120 years. You figure out a Jewish jubilee years every 50 years. 50 jubilee years from the time Adam was kicked out of the garden, which is 6,000 years ago, that's 120 jubilee years. Time's up! We are at the end of man's days on the earth right now. Jesus is coming back in two days. A day with God is a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. He's coming back in two days. When was He crucified? When did He put His blood on the altar? In the year 30. Because our Gregorian calendar is off by about three years. So in the year 30. Well, when's 2,000 years? I mean, we've had so many people over the years predicting that when Jesus was going to return. But let me just ask you this, and I'm not predicting anything. But when is 2,000 years up? In the year 2030. So, regardless, we're right on the edge. We're right on the edge of the return of Jesus. Now, let me read you something out of uh, a book, a great book written by a dear friend of mine. I know him well. It's, uh, now it's just teasing there for everyone. It's the paradise of God. Uh, talks about the, the circle of time. In the Western way of thinking, time is linear. However, the ancient Hebrew concept of time is that time is circular and eventually circles back upon itself, making it never-ending. In the same way that a traditional clock is not in a line, but the hands move in a circular motion, and eventually return to the same position, the ancient Hebrews of the Bible did not see time with a singular defined beginning and end. They saw time as a continu continual cycle of beginnings and endings like a helix. A helix is a scientific term that describes a three-dimensional spiral curve. In the same way, now follow me on this, in the same way that threads on a bolt continually circle the bolt without touching or overlapping a previous circle, but move upward, the Hebrew concept of time is also circular in nature with a continual unending movement upward toward God. Because the Western culture sees time as linear, it's much more difficult to understand the continual, unending concept of time. With a circular view of time, our perspective of the beginning and the end of earth and man's days on the earth changes. And there are several more pages concerning time in here. But science <coughs> and God agree on everything you're going to find that science does not disprove God. Science proves God. And I don't care 
what kind of a PhD a person has. You know, PhD for us means past having doubt. For some people, it just means post hole digger. You know, it can mean a lot of different things. But regardless of your educational level, you as a Christian should not be afraid of science. Because science, true science, will prove God. Science says that time began 13.8 billion years ago. They have no explanation of what was beyond that. God's Word says time never really ever began. Time is eternal. It's difficult sometimes to imagine that God, no matter how far back in time you go, you can't go far enough to find the beginning of God because there is no beginning of God. God began a lot of things, but He Himself never began. He always, According to the Bible, He always has been, He always will be, and He is. And He can insert Himself at different places in this linear timeline that we're on right now. Time was created for us. Let me ask you a question. This is a very logical question and shouldn't be difficult. How in the world could God predict the millennium? What the devil's going to do? How could He predict wars and rumors of wars and the things that the Bible its in print says is going to happen? How can He predict these things with such accuracy if the future hasn't happened yet? Okay, now tighten up here. The future hasn't happened yet for you and me. But let me tell you something. God has already been there. And Here's a paradox. Even though you have free choice and nothing affects your choices but you. You make all the choices. The devil makes all of his choices. The angels and the people who rebel at the end of the millennium, they make all of their own choices. But even though they have and you have and I have freedom of choice, without affecting our choice, God can go down through the corridors of time and He can see what you are going to do even though you're the one who decides to do it. He knows what decisions you're going to make precisely before you make them without predestining you. People say, well, if God already knows what's going to happen, then what difference does it make what I do or what I think because it's all planned out? No, no, you're planning it out. Now, now follow me on this word. He has foreknowledge, not for control, not for manipulation. He has foreknowledge. He knows what you're going to do. So, what does that tell us? That tells us very clearly God is not restricted by time. However, we are. Let me give you a couple scriptures, then we're going to close. Ephesians 5.15 Ephesians 5.15 See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Next verse. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You can look that up. What does that mean, redeeming the time? That means simply this. The devil... One of the things that he comes to steal, remember John 10.10, he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. One of the things and one of the main things he comes to steal is your time. Because every minute he can steal your time. That is time that you cannot do what God is wanting you to do if the devil has stolen it. What is one of the, the biggest problems with people sneaking off and doing stuff they shouldn't be doing? All the time they're sneaking off and doing what they shouldn't be doing, that time is gone. We need to redeem it. How do we do that? We take back what the devil tries to steal. Value 
your time. Wow. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. I'm going to add a phrase there that's not there. Teachers who will steal their time. You must understand, when, when you are listening to false teaching, it's stealing your time. Wow. 1 Peter 3.6 Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. <clears throat> The purpose of this verse is this. <clears throat> you need to get on God's timetable. Quit trying to do things under your own time. Let God do things in His time because in due time, when the time is due, He will do what needs to be done. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that. And I, <laughs> but, but the reality is, there are times when you have to humble yourself. And it may look to the world like you are being put down. But in due time, you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And He'll lift you up. Nothing wrong with being lifted up as long as God's the one that lifts you up. Alright. Revelation 2.21 Boy, without getting into the whole story of this, because that's a whole sermon by itself, and I think you all know that. But just follow me on the concept here. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Let me tell you something. God, God will give you time to get things straight. You want to get things straight in your life? Seek God. He will give you time. He'll open up time for you to get things straight. You will never stand before the Father and He say, why didn't you do this? And you, you cannot say, I didn't have time. I would have, but I just didn't have time. No, He's going to give you, He's going to give you time to repent. You're messing up in a certain area? Seek God. He'll give you time to repent. Alright. That's another one of those hip hip. No, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> now, God has divided time into sections and dispensations, and we are in the final dispensation of man's days on the earth. 2,000 years for this dispensation of time. The age of grace. The age of the church. A time when we have been blessed to be living in a time when all we have to do is believe in Jesus and we become the church. We become a part of the church. We become a part of His body. We become a part of the trophies of His grace. We're not just in the last of this time. We are in the last little sliver of time. Now is the time to make the right decision. Now is the time, if you're going the wrong way, now is the time to turn around. You know, there's going to be a time when the Father says, Son, now. And Jesus is going to appear in the clouds. You may think, well, that's not really going to happen. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. The Bible says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God. Jesus is coming back in the, in the clouds, in the sky, and we are going to be caught up. Whether you believe it or not, that's what the Bible says is going to happen, and it's going to happen. When that happens, it's going to be like the door on, the, on Noah's ark. There is a day when the door closes, and you can't get in. That's when this dispensation of time ends. The church age is over. Is it possible to escape hell after that? Yes, it is. 
But you will not be a part of the body of Christ. You will not be a part of the church. You will not have a glorified body. You will not rule and reign for all eternity out of the new Jerusalem. There's a lot of things you give up by not receiving Jesus in the time He has provided. Where does science and the Bible agree? They agree on this. For man, time is relative. But even Einstein and all the physicists and the theoretical physicists of the day, and I've looked up almost all of the popular ones and read their writings, they agree on this. Time moves forward. Time can go faster or slower. Time can even possibly slow down to a crawl. But time for man in this physical existence with atoms and electrons and molecules and all that kind of stuff that we have here in, in this, in this uh, universe that we are in, time does not move backwards. Now, God, as we said earlier, somehow, I don't know how, but somehow He goes back and erases your previous sins. But that's the only place in the Word of God where I can find anything happens in past time. And it's only God who does it. So for us, we need to redeem the time. Are you following me? What do they call it when you go to jail? You do what? Time. Well, let me tell you something. You're doing time too. You may not be in jail, but you're doing time. And we need to redeem it for the Lord. Praise God. Did you get anything out of this today? Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we make this commitment to You today to redeem the time. To not waste this precious gift of time that You have given us. Thank You, Father. And now we're going to make a confession. Because the Bible says, if you speak with your mouth and you believe in your heart that the things you say will come to pass, you will have what you say. And we are going to confess that we are going to redeem the time. Somebody may say, well, I don't have as much time left as you. Now, no one knows how much time anybody has left. Some of us may be here at the rapture. Some of us may not be. Somebody says, are you sure that this is the last generation before Jesus? Well, let me tell you something. It's your last generation. <laughs> Whether He comes in your lifetime or not, this is your last generation. There's no generation for you after this that you can live in and make a decision. So let's make this confession too, and I'm going to make it with you. I promise to God that I will not waste the precious gift of time that You have given me, Father. I will use my time for Your glory, for Your commandments, for the resting of my body, for the speaking of Your Word, and for living the way You want me to live. I will not let the devil have my time. I proclaim it. It's done. Amen.